Our scripture this morning is Acts 24, verses 1 through 23. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. <clears throat> when Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in, in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you would be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. But when the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as followers of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men. For there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you bringing charges if they have anything against me. Or these who, who are here should state the crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias the commander comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. <clears throat> So we look at Paul, and he's, he's on trial again. <laughs> it seems like he's always on trial, and there's going to be a couple more of them. Um, but the key interpretive verse that I want us to see is, so I gladly make my defense. I gladly make my defense. You know, I don't know if any of you have been on trial for anything. <clears throat> it's not usually a comfortable thing. Um, you know, for some reason, I have, I've testified in court a whole bunch of times as, a, as an expert witness um, for mental health stuff and for parenting and things like that. And you know what? I was nervous every time. I'm standing before that judge. I felt like I was the one in trouble and I didn't have anything to do with it. There's just something about standing before somebody who's an authority like that that just, is, just kind of is a little scary makes you uncomfortable. But Paul makes a glad defense. And, you know, maybe a, a more common thing is if you've ever even had to sit before a boss for an evaluation, you know, several years ago, they instituted these annual, 
evaluations that basically every place, every, every major business does. And so you got to go through and you got to fill out some stuff and you got to go back and forth. And <clears throat> often people can be scared for weeks because of that. Paul's life is on the line here. It's a little more significant. And he makes a glad defense. And I want to go through some ways that he did it so that we can do it, so that we're not, we're not feeling nervous no matter what happens. Now, maybe it's an informal thing. You know, your spouse accuses you of doing something that you didn't really do, or maybe you did do. And you feel like you're on the defense. That's not any fun either. So to have a glad defense, <clears throat> how Paul does this, number one, he has a clear conscience. He has a clear conscience. He tells us, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. You know, Paul never, never claimed to be perfect, never claimed to be sinless. Sometimes we want to look at Jesus and we look at Paul as kind of taking over the ministry. But Paul never claimed to be sinless. In fact, he called himself the chief of sinners because he had killed Christians. But yet he said he has a clear conscience. Now, how can Paul have a clear conscience after doing something so, so bad? Have you ever felt guilty over something that was, it was a long time ago and you just continue to beat yourself up, and why did I do that, and I can't believe it. <clears throat> Paul has sins here probably worse than we do, and yet he has a clear conscience. You know why? It's because he knows how to accept God's forgiveness. He met Jesus, and Jesus forgave him, and he knew he was forgiven. You know, now the devil will remind us once in a while that, hey, you did this back, way back, you know what? God's forgiven me so I can have a clear conscience. <clears throat> he had a clear conscience, first of all, with God. He's at complete peace with God. Isn't that a good place to be? Now, how do you stay at peace with God? You keep short accounts with sin. Whenever you realize that I've screwed up, I've sinned, <laughs> Lord... Forgive me, I repent. Help me turn around, go the other way. Because you know what, if, he knows it anyways. I don't know why we sometimes struggle to confess our sins to God, because he already knows what they are. But we want to kind of hold out and act like we're hiding out, and like, you know, finally we will confess them. Keep short accounts. You know, we're going to trip and fall. We're going to miss the mark, which is really the word for sin. You miss the mark. You're going to shoot at something, and you're going to end up somewhere else. We miss the mark. Ask God to forgive you and confess your sins, and he'll cleanse you. And Paul is the example of that. He's not guilty in God's eyes. And you know what? If you know you're not guilty in God's eyes, God's the highest power that you can see. He has peace with God. He's not guilty, and he has peace with God. And he realizes God is the ultimate judge because he talks about the resurrection and the judgment. And he understands God is in control. So he's at peace with God. And if there's a time that you have to defend yourself for anything, whether it's a, a little thing or even if you're just being evaluated for something. Having peace with God goes a long way. Because you know God's in charge of this. Second, he had peace with himself. Sometimes it's harder to find peace with ourself than it is to find peace with God, isn't it? You know, I've heard so many people say, well, God's, I know God's forgiven me, but I just can't forgive myself. When you say that, you know what you're saying? You're saying two things, really, without thinking about it. First of all, you're saying the blood of Jesus isn't enough. And you don't want to say that. 
The second thing you're saying is, my standard for holiness is higher than God's is. Because God can forgive me, but nope, I'm not forgiving myself. I don't think you want to say that. But that's often where we struggle, is beating ourselves up, forgiving ourselves. And it might not even be for things that would even be considered a sin. It just might be for dumb things we do. We've, you know, dropped the ball somewhere. <clears throat> but Paul was at peace with himself. He hadn't violated his own conscience. And that's a great place to be. You know, we all have our beliefs and our, you know, our view of holiness and how we should be before God. And then we all fall a little bit short of it, don't we? You know, a lot of times, basically, we don't live up to our own rules for ourselves. Maybe that's the best way to put it. But, you know, Paul had peace and there was very little room between his expectations for himself and his life, the way he lived it out. So he was at peace with himself. There was no double life here. He was straightforward. He was the same person everywhere. He had, I guess, what we would call personal integrity. You might not like him. You might not agree with him. But he had integrity. So he had peace with himself. And then he had a clear conscience before man. He hasn't done anything that hasn't been confessed or dealt with. He puts the facts out here because he's got nothing to hide. That's a nice place to be, isn't it? To where you don't have anything to hide. Everything that he had done is either confessed and forgiven... And if there were apologies owed, he made them, and so that he could be at peace with others. The Bible talks about being above reproach, which is hard to understand sometimes. But it basically means that everything against anybody else, it's either been confessed and dealt with, uh, or, or you've apologized for it. And so nobody can bring anything against you that hasn't already been processed. Now, does that mean there might not be people who might not like you? Absolutely not. I mean, you can only do your part, Romans 12 says, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. You're only half of the equation. You can only do your part. Some people may hate you anyways, like they did Paul. You know? There's not really much we can do about them, but we can still have a clear conscience and have our conscience clear in front of people, before men. There's, there's really nothing anybody can bring against us that isn't already kind of out there. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't personal privacy. It doesn't mean you have to go tell everybody everything about your life. Um, <clears throat> but it means that there's, there's no skeletons in the closet. There's nothing to hide, <clears throat> which is the second thing. Paul has nothing to hide, nothing to hide at all. He says in verse 11, you can easily verify. It had only been 12 days ago. There would be people at the temple who would still remember what happened, that he was walking in there doing his vow, doing his, making his sacred duty, and that he didn't violate any of the rules. And uh, so it could be verified. He lived his life out in the open. He was the same everywhere. He didn't sneak around or try to do things in secret. And if you've ever done that, boy, it seems like a lot of work to me. You know, to try to sneak around and do things that other people don't know. Because it's always going to come out. I remember the verse, you know, I heard it when I was little, before I was even a Christian. Be sure your sins will find you out. (laughs) It always, all those secrets and all those things, they eventually come out and cause you trouble. I've seen people who had secrets come out 10 or 15 years later. And, boy, that's tough. You know, marital struggles or things that had happened way, way, way in the past, but it had been kept in the dark and it was secret, and then it comes out and it's like it's brand new. And... You know, it's just so good to not have to hide anything. And that's where Paul was. 
<clears throat> Another way you could say it is Paul's location services were on. <laughs> you know, you got your phone and you put these location services and stuff, and people say, oh, I don't want anybody to know my, my location. Shoot, my location's on all the time. Everybody knows where I'm at. Or if they don't, I don't care if they know where I'm at. <clears throat> um, I send, you know, when we were on the bike trip, I put my location things on so Jill could see kind of where we were at, because most of the time we didn't have cell service, so it would come up, <laughs> I'm sure, now and then. And, uh, you know, there's nothing to hide. We're not going anywhere or doing anything that isn't out in the open. And uh, that's, that gives Paul the ability to make this defense, because bottom line is he knew he wasn't guilty of any crimes. He had nothing to be ashamed of. He wasn't a people pleaser. And you know, some people don't like conflict. And they're usually really, really nice people. But what they end up doing is they'll go over here and tell this person what they want to hear because they don't want to cause any conflict. And then they'll go over here and tell this person what they want to hear because they don't want to have any conflict. And then eventually what happens is these people compare stories and say, wait a minute. And I think their motives are they just want to be easy to get along with, but the result is they end up, the stories are so different it ends up basically being a lie. <clears throat> Paul wasn't like that. He wasn't very good at telling people what they want to hear. In fact, he was probably the opposite. He probably spent more time telling people what they didn't want to hear, which is what got him in trouble. He wasn't really a people pleaser. He was trustworthy. Because he had nothing to hide, he was trustworthy. His story could be easily verified. Everything he had done had been in the open, and so he was a trustworthy guy. You could count on Paul being Paul. Whether you liked Paul or didn't like Paul, he was going to be the same. He was trustworthy. And the facts were clear and could be substantiated by others. So Paul had nothing to hide. That's part of the reason he could make a glad defense. <clears throat> Number three, he was unashamed of his faith. He was unashamed of his faith. You know, and in many ways, things aren't that different for us than they were for Paul. I remember as a young Christian trying to figure out how to make it in the shop. Because most of the people there weren't Christians. And so what do you do? Do you just try to not say anything, and then eventually you get pushed to a point where you're not comfortable because of your faith? And then you're like, ah, oh, what do I do? <clears throat> and I finally after a couple different shops and a couple different experiments on that, figured out, you know what? It just seems to make the most sense to just put it out up front. You don't have to push it on anybody. There are always those people who, you know, they got to they gotta drive everybody nuts. You don't have to be one of those people, but hey, put your faith out straight, straight up front. And then it, it is what it is. You don't have anything to hide there. And Paul wasn't ashamed of his faith. And even in in the situation that I'm in now, as a mental health counselor, uh, there used to be a lot of strife between psychology and faith. <clears throat> they didn't like each other very well. And it used to be to where, boy, if you uh, said you were a Christian or anything like that, you were pretty well blacklisted. But you know, in every one of my places of employment, when I went in, I said, hey, you know, one of the things is I'm going to keep within the limits. I'm not going to push my faith on anybody because in that job, that's not my job. In this job, it's a little different. I'm not, the, I'm not a mental health counselor to make converts, but I'm there to help them. And I'm going to pray with my clients if they're Christians, and that would be helpful. And I'm going to be who I am, and I'm going to do Christian counseling to, for Christians. And I'll see people who aren't Christians or atheists or anything like that, but I've been right up front with it. And you know what? Not once has that ever given me any, given me any trouble. Even when the, the leadership there, you know, may or may not see things the same way. Uh, in the past, there was a couple times like that. 
they still respected that. <clears throat> and Paul, that's what he did. And his example is just being unashamed of his faith. Because he says, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. He goes through his, his defense. But then he says, I do admit that I worship the God of our forefathers. As a follower of the way, which is a way of saying, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That was one way that Christians were called. So he says, basically, I'm a follower of Jesus. If that makes me guilty, well, then I'm guilty. And I heard somebody ask one time, a pastor who's a friend of mine, heard him preach a sermon, and he said, you know what? If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to consider you guilty? Would there be enough evidence that you're a Christian, that you'd be guilty of it? And that's a good way to think about it. You know, Paul, yeah, he says, if, if I'm guilty for being a follower of Jesus, okay, then, then that's out front here. Which that wasn't what they were saying, uh, in a way. And he says, I'm a follower of the way, I believe. He says... I have hope in the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. You know, we don't hear a lot about the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. But there's a truth that we all ought to know that one day we're all going to stand before God. And Paul brings that up. And he says, you know what? Whatever happens to me here on earth... That's not all that important because someday I'm going to stand before the judge of all judges at the resurrection of the dead and I'm going to have to answer for the life that I lived. And the first question is, did you follow Jesus? And if that's the answer, then your sins are forgiven. But he says, I believe in that. But, you know, the judgment also, there are rewards. And Paul's looking forward to heavenly rewards. And sometimes on those days you feel like nothing's going right and life's really turned you upside down. If you're following Jesus through it, you know, you're getting heavenly rewards for that. We forget about that. But heavenly rewards can be really motivational. So he says, I believe in the resurrection of the righteous and of the wicked. And God knows the difference. And he says, I strive. I have a passionate devotion. I work, I work at it. I put my energy towards being a Christian. That's what I'm about. And it was a given. It was a conviction. It was one of those things that it ain't going to change. You know, we all have those like core values, those things about us that it's not changing. <laughs> it's part of who we are. And for Paul... After meeting Jesus on that Damascus road, he says, I'm never going back. I don't care. I'm never going back. And we've seen Christians all over the world, even in our present day, lose their lives because I'm not denying Jesus. Basically, they had the same view that Paul does. There's going to be a resurrection. So you can go ahead and kill me now, but I'm going to be resurrected and stand before Christ. And so are you. And uh, it was a conviction. He couldn't hide it. Nobody would change it. <clears throat> and then number four, he told his story. He clearly stated what he was doing, why he was doing it, as well as the reaction of others. He didn't embellish it. He basically just told it very clearly and factually. He didn't deny or minimize the issues at hand. He said, there's some other Jews from Asia. Maybe they ought to be here because they're kind of the ones who really started this. And he said, yeah, if, if, if I'm in trouble for this, yeah, I did that. He had clearly committed no crime, and he stated this. And you know, there is always value in our story. Don't ever forget that. You have a story. Now, I can never try to explain why everything that happened in your life happened. I don't know. But I know that it's part of God's story for you. God took you, even before you knew him, maybe, before, through things 
because he knew there would be a time. And you have a story. If you've met Jesus, you have a story. And whether that story is that I met Jesus very young and I just stayed faithful to him my whole life, I think that's a great story. Or whether you say, man, I messed things up really bad before I met Jesus. You have a story and nobody can really argue with your story. You were there. You're a witness of what God did in your life. And people can argue, you know, about evolution or creation or all of these sideline issues. But they can't really argue with you when you say, you know what, Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. They don't have to maybe believe it, but they can't really argue with it. And that's what Paul's saying here. He doesn't go back into his whole story. And I think that's sometimes the art that we learn after being a Christian for a while. Which part of our story is going to be helpful right here? You know, God helped me here. Maybe God dug you out of a financial mess. Or maybe God forgave you and changed your life from a, a, some kind of a sinful lifestyle. Maybe he just gave you peace. You know, maybe he helped you through an unbearable struggle. Whatever that story is, the part of it that that other person needs to hear. You know, learn, learn to be selective with that. But you have a story. Don't ever forget that. You have a story. So like Paul, my encouragement to you is to, to join me in this, this quest of, number one, having a clear conscience. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. Don't have anything to hide. Don't be ashamed of your faith. Jesus wasn't ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed of him. And don't forget the power of your story. God can use that in ways that we can't even imagine. There are people that you can touch, that your story is going to touch, that nobody else is in this room will. Every one of us has a special part. Let's pray. God, we thank you. <clears throat> we thank you for Paul's example. We thank you for the way that he shows us how to live in a way that he doesn't have to be negative about making a defense. In fact, Lord, he's glad to testify of you and to testify of what he's done. And Lord, he has such peace. Give us that peace, Lord. Give us that passion. Lord, if there is anybody here this morning that has a conscience that's not clear, God, I pray that you, by your spirit, would show them any sin in their life, and then also show them your forgiveness as they confess it to you. Lord, I pray that when we walk out of these doors, we might walk out feeling cleansed, and Lord, feeling empowered and feeling free. Lord, that's our goal. Help us to sh keep short accounts with you, and the Lord to be your witnesses and tell your story when you give us the opportunity. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.